play with me, it said. I stirred in my bed, my eyes drowsy and heavy. A yawn blew out of my mouth. I was seconds away from falling deep into my dreams, but the voice shook me back to reality. Play with me, it repeated, a child's voice. One that I came to recognize early in my childhood. I laid with my eyes still closed, denying the fact that I woke up. I still felt exhausted and at the verge of passing out, if I just relaxed a little longer. Play with me, it muttered, but its tone somehow changed. It didn't come out with hostility, but somehow it snatched my attention immediately. It sounded hopeless and lost, and it felt as if those same feelings provoked me at that moment. I imagined my bed forming lips right before where I laid. For some reason, this image stuck to my brain. Play with me. Play with me. The words continued to barrage my mind, leaving me restless and frantic. Now I wanted to open my eyes, but some mystical force kept them from splitting open. The lips on my bed moved and hummed. I felt the chilling vibration under where I laid. A tongue stretched out of its lips and licked my entire back. I tried moving my limbs, but just like my eyes, they remained paralyzed. Play. With. Me. The lips opened wide and released a hot steam of breath. The air below scorched my entire body. My body sank deeper inside my bed, the sheets and comfort swallowing me whole. At this point, breathing became an impossible task. The oxygen surrounding me grew thin. Darkness consumed my sight. I opened my eyes. Everything remained still. Nothing seemed disturbed. Well, except for me, of course. From the window above my head, the moon shone its silver light through my blinds. My heart raced a million miles per second. With the help of the moon, I managed to scan my entire room for anything suspicious. Everything appeared normal and intact, thankfully. Sweat drenched my entire body, making my pajamas and bedsheets stick to my skin like superglue. I thought about pulling away my blanket in order to cool myself down, but something told me it'd be better if I just laid underneath the sheets. Maybe it was my childish mind pretending that my blankets can actually protect me from any monster or demon. Oh, how I miss the innocence of my mind as a kid. The creepiness of what I just experienced settled my mind. I shivered deeply into my bed, despite how hot my body felt. Some traces of my memory told me that everything was just some sick and bizarre nightmare, but I knew better than that. At that point in my childhood, I dealt with my fair share of paranormal experiences. Play with me. This time I heard the child's tenuous voice loud and clear. As calm and as gentle as the child's tone sounded, it somehow pierced the silence inside my room like a sharp knife slicing through human flesh. Worst of all, it stimulated whatever emotion I felt the most at the moment, and currently, anxiety took hostage of my conscience. I peeked at the closet door that stood across from me. The moonlight provided full clarity of the entire wooden surface. Both doors remained closed, just how I left them right before I slept. A noise came from behind the closet doors. It sounded like someone or something shuffling in between my clothes. The first levels of trepidation kept my body at bay. I wanted nothing more than to run away, but the child's voice already drew me in with its mystical hands and they refused to let me go. The door creaked open the rusty hinges releasing a sour hiss, and the bottom of the closet door grinding against the hardwood floor. I rattled in my bed as if I was having a seizure. Each second that passed by stretched farther and farther. More movement occurred behind the shadows the closet door created. I struggled hard to gather my thoughts, but they scattered themselves and blew far away from my mind like pieces of paper against an autumn wind. Play with me. I heard the child better. Now that the closet door didn't restrict the full volume of his voice, that was worse for me, however. I tried bottling in all of my terrified emotions, but the bastard broke the glass free, 
and let my feelings spill out of my skin and bones like blood from an open wound. At this point, I thought I'd drown in my sweat. The child stepped forward. I heard the sound of his soft and delicate foot tap against the floor. I strained my eyes harder at the closet door, trying to catch a quick glimpse at the boy who had been disturbing my sleep for over a year now. Every time I try, however, I always failed. The child always hid himself amongst the shadows. He took his time approaching me, as if hesitant and fearful of my own presence. When this happened, I began feeling sympathetic towards the poor child. I reminded myself that every night he paid me a visit. He never tried to hurt or harass me. Sure, he sometimes scared the crap out of me, but this seemed unintentional. It was only my own head worried and paranoid about the unknown, nothing more. The child swayed closer to where I was laid. What more can I have done but just lay there and let the boy do as he pleased? Some of the nights the child crept out of my closet door, he spent most of his time gazing in my direction. Even though I couldn't tell if he even had eyes to look at me, I still sense his glare on my face. At first this really freaked me out. I mean, who would enjoy being stared at as you try to sleep? But it almost felt as if he was guarding me from my own nightmares. But always, no matter what, he asked the same question over and over again. Play with me. I never responded back. I always just fell back to sleep or waited until the sun rose and the boy returned back to my closet or wherever the hell he came from. That night, however, I finally spoke back. Okay, I whispered, my words leaving my lips like syrup drooling out of my mouth. What do you want to play? The boy stopped walking. I knew I surprised it somehow. The nervous energy that transpired between us almost felt like something tangible. I waited with patience to see what would happen next. The child shrilled and let out a loud shriek. I joined in on the screaming, as if trying to compete who can shout the loudest. Immediately after this, the boy's entire presence vanished from where he remained. But before the boy disappeared, I spotted something weird about him. See, the moment he left, a small flash of light emerged from where he stood. This granted my eyes just one split second to finally see what the child looked like. What I saw was far from what I expected. The first thing that caught my eyes was the boy's face. He looked pale as snow, and his lips appeared numb and blue. A small helmet of blonde hair rested on top of the boy's head. Dirt and grass was smeared all over the child's cheeks and forehead. The most distinctive feature, however, were the boy's hollow, demented eye sockets. They looked like two endless dark tunnels. The longer you gazed at the child's empty eyes, the more the shadows inside sucked you in. Right in the middle of the boy's body, just inside his intestines, remained a big blob of red and yellow light. A maze of veins glowed inside the boy's naked stomach. It almost seemed as if the child was pregnant. It took me a while to recognize him. Right before I realized who he was, I yelled until my throat began bleeding from the inside. It was Ricardo, my best friend who died when I was only five years old. This incident occurred when I was six years old. A lot has changed over the past 11 years, but to some extent nothing has changed at all. Sometimes the thing you least expect to end up happening does so after all. For instance, I never would have predicted that I would befriend the ghost that had been haunting my nights since I was five years old, but I'll get to that in a bit. To explain the story, I guess I need to begin when my family and I moved to Union City around the turn of the 21st century. I was two at the time, still very young and naive to the many dangers that possesses the earth. The reason my family left New York and entered New Jersey instead was because of the death of their stillborn child. I was supposed to have an older sibling, but the child died during birth. It happens often and nobody's to blame really. My parents, however, couldn't properly deal with the shame and guilt of their first child dying. They became very unstable and reckless because of it. A month or so after the infant died, they immediately tried once more to make another child, I guess out of desperation. This is how I was brought into this world. 
I'm the result of two emotionally broken adults who relied on my birth to restore their hope in this world. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing for me, but either way I managed to survive this time. Even after my birth, however, my folks still carried weight of their deceased baby on their shoulders. They quickly left New York as soon as possible. They stated that the city and house they lived in constantly reminded them of their dead baby. All of my parents' neighbors and friends looked forward to the upcoming child at the time. When my folks informed everyone that the child never made it out of the womb alive, the disappointment that crossed their lives escalated to something morbid and pitiful. I claim myself a New Yorker, even though I lived most of my life in New Jersey. My parents often took me there since my father still worked at his job in the big city. They used to always take me near where they once lived and introduce me to all of their previous neighbors. I remember very distinctively how most of them glared and studied me. They thought of me as a child from heaven itself. They always littered me with gifts and provided special privileges for whatever I desired. I was always shy around them so I never begged for anything, and at times the attention became overwhelming. During some of our trips, however, I began noticing the hidden depression in my parents' hearts once they spent a little too much time around their house. I once caught my mother crying inside one of her best friend's rooms when I was four. When I approached her and asked her what was wrong, she simply shook her head, a water full of tears rushing down her red eyes, and took hold of my back and shoulders with her bare arms. My mother embraced me with a gracious hug and whispered in my ear how much she loves me and how lucky I am to be a part of her life. Her moist and warm face rubbed against my own cheeks. At some occasions I would have found this annoying but I sensed and empathized with my mother's pain even at such a young age. Even though I had no idea what the heck was going on, I still knew that I needed to hug my mother strongly in order to make her feel better. Despite the setbacks my parents faced, they somehow found a way to move forward. At such a young age, I learned to be grateful at the circumstances that passed through my life. Some parents might have fought and divorced each other if something this tragic ever shot at their lives. Some parents might have relied on drugs and alcohol in order to melon out the agony dwelling deep in their hearts and souls. But my parents decided to act differently. They looked at me as inspiration and chose to dedicate their life to raising me right. They thanked God that I had survived and took it as a sign to make the best life for me. For this, I owe them all of my regards, and I can't be any more appreciative for what they've done. But nothing, nothing could have prepared the three of us for what hit me when I turned five. My close friend from kindergarten passed away around that time. His name was Ricardo Hernandez. I knew this kid since I started school at the age of four in pre-K. We met there, and that same first day we instantly became best pals. I remember we couldn't remember our names the first few weeks, so we just each called each other Amigo. It was adorable. As bashful as I was, I somehow managed to be comfortable with him only. We just clicked. I can't seem to explain it any other way. Ricardo died from breathing problems. I didn't quite know the specifics back then. I just knew that he needed to remove his tonsils. Ricardo's folks scheduled the appointment to proceed with the treatment as soon as they found out. I think a day or so before the surgery was supposed to happen, he died in his own bed while watching cartoons. The hospital told his parents, that the dysfunction of his lungs wasn't anything that serious, but I guess they must have overlooked something important. Death has a way of messing with parents. If the Grim Reaper does exist, then that son of a bitch must have some grudge against my mother and father. They reacted with devastation at the news of my best friend's sudden death. They knew how close Ricardo and I became, and because of his friendship, my parents ended up befriending Ricardo's parents. Like any decent adult would do, my mother and father comforted and mourned with my best friend's parents together. I guess they also understood how it felt to lose a child at such a young age. This was just what my parents needed. Right when they finally overcame all odds and learned to live with the death of their infant son, life or God or whoever the hell finds some messed up way to remind my parents of their most stressful and dismaying point of their lives with another death. When I first found out about the news, the principal from my school visited our class and delivered the awful story. The day before this happened, the other students and I caught our teacher, Miss Ventra, crying and moping near the hallways. Out of all of her children, 
she cared and respected Ricardo the most. He always charmed our teacher in a way that amazed me as a young kid. His death really impacted us all. I mostly handed the situation with apathy, and I don't know if that makes me some emotionless monster or not. Children understand a lot despite their age, and I was fully aware of what happened to Ricardo. All of my classmates were. He died, and he was never coming back. This fact stuck to our brains, and nothing would be able to take it away. Don't get me wrong, I did feel like crap on the inside. I lost my only friend who brought something out of me. I really didn't get along with all the other kids. It's not like they bullied me or anything, but I just chose to isolate myself from them. What got to me the most was witnessing my parents circle around a difficult depression once again. For the next month or so, the environment inside my house consisted of nothing but gloom and hopelessness. Every time I walked inside, I just sensed the sadness sleeping into my head and emotions. My mom and dad tried encouraging everyone to feel better, and sometimes I actually believed that we were healing from this tragic point in our lives. But at the end of these futile attempts, we're met with everyone giving up. I felt disgusted with my parents and myself. A year or so after Ricardo's death, I began experiencing these unexplainable paranormal interactions. They began around the time I was six. Late one night, I think it was Saturday, I was snuggled in my bed with the lights off. I was playing my Nintendo Game Boy Advance at the moment. I don't remember what time it was exactly, but I'm more than certain it was past midnight. I made sure to stay quiet since at this time my parents were already sleeping. I started to feel tired after an hour or so playing Pokemon Sapphire. My eyes kept on opening and closing, and I took this as a sign to go to sleep. Right before I could even turn off my device, I heard the faintest of sounds coming from my closet. This aroused me instantly, and whatever sleepiness I felt before vanished. Bewilderment took over that exhaustion. I waited for the noise to come again. After a minute or so in suspense, I didn't realize I was holding my breath anymore. I held my Game Boy above my face, the screen flashing its colorful lights on my eyes. I pressed start and saved my game, but I didn't turn off my device. I needed it as a source of light. I aimed the device towards my closet door and waited for something to happen. Anything. A loud bump sounded off behind the doors. I dropped my Game Boy right on my face. Ouch! I winced and rubbed my nose. A jolt of pain spread all over my face. Play with me, I heard for the first time. I laid paralyzed with apprehension. The sting on my nose suddenly seemed less important. For the first few seconds I remained confused and a bit unnerved. Then that confusion evolved into frustration for not understanding what just happened. From frustration, I grew distressed and paranoid. Suddenly, the shadows inside my room seemed too dark. The walls appeared too thick. My blankets choked me a little bit too much. The pillows below my face felt as if they were suffocating me, and the whole world was going against me. The paranoia fused with the worst of my fears. I went to scream, but my throat locked in itself. The inside of my mouth grew dry. I thought about jumping out of my bed but dismissed that idea. Like any normal child, I resorted to my blankets for comfort and safety. I remember burying my body deep inside my sheets and refusing to open my eyes. Nothing else happened after that, however. I stood awake for most of my time there, and when I woke up I suffered from a tremendous headache. But other than that, I remained undamaged and sane. I prevented myself from confronting my parents about this. They were already dealing with enough, and if I just told them about my weird and creepy experience, I would just bring them even more things to worry about. And besides, nothing bad happened to me. That was what mattered the most. The next week came and the same thing happened again. This time, however, I maintained a bit more of my composure. I still felt my terrified thoughts crawling into my mind but it wasn't as unbearable as before. I mostly felt speculation. A part of me wanted to say it was a ghost, but being that young, I still knew how ridiculous that sounded. Strange things like that only happen in movies or in novels. For the next week and on, I spent most of my time pondering about what I was dealing with. I analyzed everything, from the time the apparent ghost decided to sneak in my room 
to the movement and sounds it made. I came to several conclusions after three months of thinking everything through. The first thing I came up with was that it was indeed some form of a ghost, spirit, or whatever you want to call it. The second thing was that it wasn't an it, but a he. It took some time coming to this conclusion, but it was obvious. The voice said it all. It sounded light and ethereal, yes, but it contained a bit of roughness that only boys can pull off. One of the most important factors I put into consideration was that it never once tried to inflict damage upon me. That stopped me from making it a problem. Not only that, but this fact alone slowly made me adapt and accept the presence of this young child. My mind still wrestled with the fear of being stalked, but this was only natural for anyone, especially a young boy like myself. No matter what, I was still talking to the dead. If that doesn't bring chills down your spine, then you're not a human. The more knowledge I gained about the apparition, however, the more questions bombarded my mind. I told myself it would be a horrible idea to take physical notes about my experience. If someone were to take hold of that notebook and read everything through, they would assume I was either a child with amazing imagination or some type of enigmatic maniac. And seeing how my reputation in school came to be being the quiet, awkward, and slow kid, I didn't think people would guess the former. So, at the end, I was forced to remember and repeat everything I learned over and over in my head. It became arduous and onerous at first, but this helped form my expansive memory. That came in handy during school, but during that time, school was the last thing I worried about. The night finally came that after over three years of hearing but ignoring the ghost, I finally responded back. And to my amazement and shock, I ended up finding out it was my best friend Ricardo this whole time. It all made perfect sense. This changed everything. That night I stood up until early dawn. It was not of sheer terror, however, but out of an overwhelming sense of happiness. For once, this world didn't seem like a place where you shoved along as more shit piled up in your life but it became something beautiful and rewarding. Somehow, I reunited with my first and only ever friend, and that's all I cared for. The shift in my mood and attitude was unbelievable. Even my parents were astonished. I ignored the fact that my best friend looked like he crawled right out of his grave. I mean, I knew that I saw him, and I knew he looked in terrible condition, but I didn't care. I never realized how much I missed and cared for him until he returned back to my life. From that point on, I began contacting the ghost more often. He started visiting me in the night several times a week instead of once every weekend. We both talked, and the longer this happened, the more it seemed as if he was really Ricardo. The way he acted and everything he said just seemed like it fitted Ricardo's personality. I couldn't hardly believe it. I never saw him in his physical form ever again though. Every time we grouped up, he was always invisible. I could never touch or see him like before when we were kids in preschool, but I was able to feel him. I think that what was made him so special to me. It didn't matter that he would never be able to play like this before. The warm and tender presence he offered was enough to satisfy me. I remember one night when we were together, I broke down in front of him. I just released all of my frustration and sorrow into my tears and I couldn't stop crying. But it was also a weird mix of happiness and sadness. For one thing, getting Ricardo back was something I appreciated every day. I don't know what purpose it served, but I never took my friend for granted from that point on. But at the same time, I faced the horrors of school and my social life. Nobody liked me, and I faced bullies every time I entered that building. I just couldn't associate myself well with those other kids. I saw nothing in common with everyone else, and every time I attempted to speak to one of them, they glared at me with disgust and dissatisfaction. The hate on their faces was just so obvious. I did everything wrong in school, and for that reason everyone called me a failure and a mistake. And I kept on thinking that if Ricardo was with me, he could have been the person who I could have depended on for kindness. I wish those other kids died instead of my own best friend. Why did Ricardo have to die? Why did my family and I always have to endure the grief of death, while everyone else remained untouched by the Reaper's menacing hands? It wasn't my fault that I couldn't get along with those other damn kids. So much had happened to me that I felt the need to isolate myself. 
right when I wanted to crawl out of my shell and become one with my school, they rejected me and treated me like shit. The best thing about Ricardo's ghost was that he understood. That night as I drowned in my own tears, he wrapped me around a therapeutic aura and suddenly everything felt better. My deepest sorrows washed away and was replaced by an ocean of tranquility. All of my muscles eased up, the sting on my eyes mitigated and my head felt relaxed. He kept me locked around his comfortable aura even as the first rays of morning light slipped through my open curtains. This startled me. Ricardo has never stood up this late with me, and I knew he felt aversive towards any type of light. I tried wiggling away from his presence and told him to leave now before anything bad happens to him. But he kept me secured and whispered to my ear that he was going to be alright. Even then I wanted him to leave. My greatest fear was losing Ricardo again. But he told me to trust him, and that trust is the true foundation to any friendship. Ricardo said that true friendship is giving someone the key to your destruction and trusting them to not abuse you with that sacred knowledge. So I listened and followed what he said. For the first time I trusted someone outside of my family and when dawn rose up and I saw how Ricardo remained the same, I knew then and there that I didn't need anyone else in my life. As long as I had Ricardo, my one and only true best friend, I could survive in this world. That's why, when he abandoned me the moment I entered high school, I almost killed myself. It never made sense to me. He just left without a hint of where he would be. I told Ricardo everything from my darkest secrets to how I felt truly about this world, and he departed off with my trust within his grasp. He disappeared, and when he left, Ricardo took a part of me with him. I felt so disconnected with myself. We raised each other together. Throughout my whole life as a young child growing up into a teenager, he has been there for me every step of the way. Every bully I fought, every girl that denied my love, every person that refused to be my friend, Ricardo was there to witness it all. I knew the consequence I would face if Ricardo and I tried stabilizing our friendship in this world. Nobody would believe me that I was talking to the kid who died out of lung failure in kindergarten. People would just see me as a weirdo, and to be honest, I wouldn't blame them. I mean, it was pretty weird. Sometimes I needed to pause from my own distorted reality and really take in the fact that the person I loved the most was a ghost. It felt natural to me, but I knew that from an outside perspective, it would be the craziest shit ever. But I thought it would be worth it, you know, separating myself from everyone else. I'd come to like the fact that I was unique and that I had something, or better yet someone, that nobody else had. This helped rebuild my confidence and made me a more assertive person when I entered middle school. I still kept to myself, but I no longer felt inferior among my classmates. In fact, I settled into this hubris personality that I found everyone to be pieces of shit that didn't deserve my companionship. The only people who mattered to me was my family and Ricardo. Everyone else could burn in hell for all I care. Ricardo helped create some of the best moments of my life. He was always the imaginary best friend who I jumped along the couch with. Ricardo and I played with our variety of toys and we always used to act out these wild ideas in our heads. It was always a fun time with him. My parents grew a bit worried about my mental state around the time I was 11 or 12 and I was still pretending I was talking with an imaginary best friend. They thought I was a bit too old for that. Not only that, but it didn't help that I had no other friends and that they never saw me with any one of my classmates. I never invited anyone over, so they knew the type of reputation I gained from school. Placing all of these factors together, I can't blame them for thinking that I was, in some type of way, a little psychotic. One time the three of us talked about it, and I gave them some of the honest truth of my situation. Of course I didn't mention the fact that my old friend Ricardo was living with us, but I informed them that I really hated everyone in school and that I had no friends but I told them I didn't mind and that I found a way to have fun all by myself. I explained that I relied on my imagination in order to cope with the fact that nobody liked me and that sometimes I went overboard and actually thought my characters came to life. I made a deal that I would stop talking to myself if it really freaked them out. My parents agreed 
and in the end they were very understanding. They had an idea that my childhood really messed me up. So it was okay if I behaved the way I did. They accepted my weirdness, and for this I loved them even more. But they didn't need to worry about anything. Later on, as I stated before, Ricardo left me. In a way, this was worse when he actually died in kindergarten. I had this idea in mind that I would enter high school and that I would dread those awful four years there. I knew that I needed to prepare myself for all the harassment, all the fights, all the unwanted attention, and everything else that made my life a total pain in the ass. But I knew that at the end of the day, I would have Ricardo to pick me up whenever someone knocked me down. So when he left me to deal with everyone's crap in that school, I died inside. I felt so betrayed and alone, and this resulted in my worst behavior. I started the fights with the other kids, and I made sure I never backed down. Even when I almost punched a kid to death, I felt no remorse. The rational switch inside me flicked off, and I unleashed all my frustration and pain towards anyone who had the audacity to ruin my day. Ricardo leaving me really ruined me. My brain felt as if someone completely changed every function of it. I couldn't think right and forget about sleeping. I became a chronic insomniac. My world became a mess yet again. So that was my life the first three years in high school. Entering my senior year, I didn't care at all anymore. I didn't know what direction my life was heading towards, but I just couldn't care. I became this placid and dull adolescent. I wasn't scrambling fights with bullies, but at the same time I stopped myself from starting new relationships with other people. I trusted nobody because of Ricardo. So when he introduced himself to me once again last week, it turned my world upside down. What timing. Out of all the times he could have re-entered my life, he chose now, right when I stopped caring about my own existence, right when I completely forced him out of my thoughts and emotions. He decides to whisper his signature catchphrase and act as if he hadn't left me for three years filled with nothing but despair and suicidal thoughts. Why couldn't he have come when I behaved like a jerk in high school? Where was he when I returned home from the outside world with tears flooding down my eyes, wishing that I could just change the way my life turned out? Why couldn't he have come help me when I had the tip of the knife just an inch away from the vein on my wrist? ready to slice my flesh open and drown in my own blood as I bathe in my tub. Where was he then? No, he doesn't deserve a warm-hearted homecoming. I know he plans on visiting me this upcoming weekend. As much as I should be happy, he needs to know how much I suffered. I at least deserve an apology. I still care for Ricardo, but he and I know that we need to talk this through. A lot has changed since then. I'm more than prepared for this. All I can do now is wait and be patient. He better hope I'm in a good mood that night. Saturday night arrives. I lay on my bed with a book beside me. The small lamp next to me blares a faint and white light. I've spent the past three hours reading this novel and wasting time on my phone. I've kept on checking the time, and as the hour clocked moved from 9 into the night to 10, then to 11 and finally to 12, I grew a bit anxious. It feels as if parasites infected my stomach and are now crawling in and out of my organs. As nervous as my head and body gets, however, I know I must demonstrate nothing but temerity. I can't shy away now. That part of my life ended a long time ago. My parents chose the perfect weekend to leave the house for a quick getaway. That way if things start to get hectic between Ricardo and me, there are no restrictions as to how loud and aggressive I can get. I plan to handle this with maturity, but that doesn't change the fact that I can't make him feel guilty for what he's done. I place my novel on the top of my nightstand and flick the lamp off. Darkness envelopes my bedroom like a pool of shadows. The moon shoots a tiny glimmer of light right at the center of my bed. This should be enough for me to feel comfortable. Come out, I command. I started sensing him the moment it hit 11.30. For a while I fought with my nerves and fears pulsing out of my mind like a horde of bees trying to escape their hive. I knew I needed to end this influence over my feelings. I couldn't allow him to manipulate me any longer. I'm giving silence and nothing more. I focus my eyes better on the closet door. I feel him behind those barriers, so why does he hesitate? He must be aware of how disappointed I am. I don't blame him. 
If I was in his position, I would think twice about confronting me now too. I open my mouth, but before I could say more, the closet door slides open. I choke on my distasteful words and swallow them. They taste bitter. I sit upright and place my pillow against the wall behind me in order to be more comfortable. I feel his opposing force of emotions trying to break through the defensive wall I built against him. His effort proves futile, however. All this tension passing between us actually makes me sweat. My back begins to drench itself and the corners of my mouth grow so dry they form tiny blisters. I don't know how long I can maintain this. Ricardo takes his time approaching me, his soft and almost quiet footsteps taunting me each time they land on the floor. As some people might assume, I might be a little gay for my best friend. I mean, I've only spent my entire life with him alone, and I never went on a date before with any girl. I find both genders attractive in a way, but Ricardo obviously catches my attention the most. The way he's treated me with love is what finally made me realize everything. If me loving a dead ghost doesn't convince you how messed up I am, I don't know what will. My ghost friend finally reaches the edge of my bed. Although I can't see him, I feel him. I feel him near. He stands still. The silence overcoming my ears becomes unbearable. I'm able to hear the quiet sound of my impulsive heartbeat, and then I start to hear a small ringing noise deep inside my eardrums. I tap on the wall behind me in order to repel against the quietness. If I took that any longer, I would have shot my brains out. Ricardo begins to climb on top of my bed. I want to say something, anything. I want to stop him and start talking to him about what he did. But the idea of both of us sitting down face to face intrigues me more. There, he could witness the anguish in my eyes. The sheets on top of my bed rustle as he crawls closer to where I remain. I start to shiver. My breathing increases and the pressure on my chest feels like a ton of bricks slammed down my lungs. I'm sweating bullets at this point. The world surrounding me blurs and all that remains clear is the image stretching larger and larger as the seconds drift by. I almost start to feel hypnotized by my own mind and its hallucinations. Ricardo stops right where the moonlight hits my bed. That little line of light shines directly on his face. Death is written all over his expression. It's the same image that I saw back then as a kid, but this time he seems to have aged, oddly. Pieces of his once pale and soft flesh now dangle from his cheekbones. Some parts of his face appears rotten and deteriorated by the time, the skin ruddy and infected. Black slime swirls inside his mouth. Ricardo's devilish grin colored with waste and worms. Parts of his hair have fallen off, and I am able to see his bony and disfigured skull. Several bumps and warts decorate the area around his forehead and chin. And of course, the worst of all, his eyes. Ricardo's hollow and lifeless eyes that sucks the youth right out of your soul. What the heck happened to you? I ask, horror stricken. The longer I gaze at his current physical state, the more it dawns upon me how I never had my best friend back in the first place. Or better yet, this wasn't Ricardo at all. What the heck is going on? You idiot, Ricardo whispers, but this time his voice soothes out of its brusque throat with a deep and monstrous tone. Black and demonic tentacles begin to sprout out of his corpse. They drip with black blood and seem as sharp and deadly as a dagger. Something else emerges from behind Ricardo's dead body. Before I can pay attention to what it is, I'm distracted when those black whips slither closer to where I sit. They tangle around my limbs, neck, and body. A silent cry escapes out of my trembling lips, and before I could shout for help, for anybody to please help me, one of the vines closes around my mouth. I try yelling through the thick and moist tentacles, but all I manage to produce is a low muffling sound. Ricardo pulls me closer to where he sits. I shove and wiggle my shoulders and legs, but the more I try to fight, the more the vines tighten. I feel the blood circulation on my bare arms and legs end. The tight knot tied around my neck begins to crush my throat. I figure I would be panicking, but at the moment I feel nothing but a loss of hope. I won, the ghost says, although he no longer sounds like a little boy. His voice makes the bed and walls shake for God's sake. I won, and there's nothing you can do about it. 
All I can do is glare at his empty eyes and wonder whether a piece of my friend dwells inside this demonic creature or not. I can't believe I was able to outplay you like this, the spirit screeches, and then emits a low and gurgling laughter. You're such an idiot. I thought you would notice later on, but no, I made a fool out of you. Even now you have no idea what's going on, this demon mocks me, but I can't blame you. After all, you forgot about me, just like mommy and daddy forgot about me right when they had you. No. No, no way. This cannot be. Ah, you realize now, huh? I see it in your eyes. You're getting an idea of who I truly am. Ricardo's stomach begins to glow a tenuous yellow and white light. I'm what could have been. I'm a rejected soul that not even God wished to bring into heaven. Nobody cares about me. And my life means little to nothing compared to all the other babies who lived. Sounds familiar, don't it? Do you know who I am now, huh? Do you, brother? No. I knew it, but I didn't want to believe it. I don't even know what to think right now. All I can do is feel. I feel my dead baby brother's emotions and his rage that erupts out of his heart like lava from an active volcano. The determination to hurt me burns through my skin and I see the passion in his eyes despite there being just hollowness inside. Right when mommy and daddy had you, they already thought about forgetting about me, he grumbles. At first they still mourn my death, and that at least kept me content. But the older you grew, the more they left me out of their thoughts. You became the child they always wanted, and you stole their attention from me. Soon they completely abandoned me, and only chose to think about you. Did my life mean nothing to them? Was I just a failure to them that they wanted to forget about? Why couldn't I have lived? Why did I have to be you and not me? He said. I wanted to speak. I wanted to tell him that they never forgot about him, that they use his death as an inspiration to make me a better child and them better people. I need to tell him that without him, I wouldn't be who I am now. My parents, excuse me, our parents, love us both equally, but just that thinking about him resurrected too many dark and agonizing memories. But I couldn't say any of that. All I could do is listen and feel his anger. I knew I couldn't leave without making the three of you suffer. I needed my revenge. This was when I began plotting my vengeance. I wanted you all to die. So I began visiting you little by little. I gave off subtle signs of my presence, but it wasn't enough. As a baby, you didn't care about me at all. I needed to wait for the perfect time to execute my plan. Then you entered school, and you became friends with that Ricardo kid. The demon in front of me chuckles. Ah, I knew I won after that. I had it all planned out. The doctors were right, you know. His lung condition wasn't all that serious. He just needed minor surgery, that's all. But you know, I have a way of interfering with other people's lives. I guess you can say I paid Ricardo a visit while he was watching cartoons and did what I had to do. My brother is a sick bastard. I never felt so furious in my life before. I kicked and thrashed around, giving every punch and swing all of my strength, not caring if my bones began to snap and my muscles started to tear. Even as blood leaks out from my wounds, the tighter his grip becomes, I don't care. This piece of scum murdered a kid, my best friend. He caused one of the greatest depressions in my life and now he deserves to rot. Stop your efforts now, Stephen, he commands. It's useless. I've won and you can't overpower me. You're weak. You've grown strong and confident, yes, but compared to me, you're still a pathetic kid who can't stand for himself. You freak. Being attracted to your own brother, for God's sake. You make me sick, he said. I managed to wiggle my hand out and flip him off. Childish as always, I see, the demon complains. Just like Ricardo. Anyways, I knew in order for my plan to work, I needed to gain your trust. And what better person could you trust and love other than the only friend you ever have in your entire life? Wow, you're such a loser. At least I would have made more friends. I knew you'd trust me and that you'd be so infatuated with me. 
I knew that you would suffer in school and that you'd rely on me to comfort you, and I did. I made sure you fell in love with me and that I guided you towards a better life. I played you. You should be humiliated by how badly I have messed up your life, he explained. And I knew, I knew it would be perfect to just leave you right when you enter high school. Don't like being left alone, huh, Stephen? Hurts like one mean bitch, doesn't it? Now you know my pain. It felt so great watching as you broke down, and as your life turned to crap. I kept on laughing and laughing at your own demise. Even our parents' depression brought much amusement. I made you suffer, and now I return. His corpse began to levitate. The blob of light inside his stomach grew brighter, and little by little the skin of his abdomen started to become transparent. I'm able to see the inside of his stomach, and I see, oh God, oh God, I'm going to be sick. It's a fetus camped inside his intestines. I come back to finish what I started, the demon child informs me, and now I realize that this whole time the voice had been coming from the stomach, the belly of the beast. It's been fun watching you grow up, but now your life must end here. How does it feel to just realize that your whole life has been one giant lie? How does it feel knowing that after your death, our parents come next? How does this feel, Stephen? Does it burn? Well, you better get used to it because I'm going to send you exactly where our parents send me. Straight into nothingness. His corpse floats above me. More vines crawl out of his body. They all attach to my skin and begin to push my body deep into the mattress. I keep on fighting to free myself, but my brother is able to produce more and more of those tentacles. Soon, my entire figure from head to toe is webbed around his colony of whips. But the figure behind the ghost that I saw before earlier grows larger. I don't know what the heck that is, but whatever it may be, it feels strong and intimidating. Right at the center of my bed, a black hole rips open. I feel a sudden drop. My eyes open wide as I descend farther and farther away from the corpse. A wall of darkness surrounds me and begins to close around my eyesight. A gush of air forces me deeper inside whatever place I'm being sent to. I feel several hands reach up from below and grip my shirt and pants. Those thousands of hands dig their nails deep inside my skin, past the cloth of my clothing and drag me deeper inside this prison of shadows and calamity. More and more of those invisible arms stack on top of my body and place more pressure on my muscles and skin. I feel like the victim of a king cobra. At the end, I don't feel anything anymore. Well, I mean on the inside I don't. No emotions, no fears, nothing. Just pity. I pity the fact that I had this life to live. Since birth, my life has been filled with nothing but depression and wickedness. I guess I've always been destined to live this way and have it end like this. Even when I thought I had some type of profound hope to hold on to and call it my own, I end up finding out it's all been a lie that led to my eventual fatality. But I'm fine if my life continues on after death and I end up living with nothing but darkness and nothingness as my brother stated. Hell, that's all I know at this point. I won't have to make that big of an adjustment. If only my brother could have let me talk though, maybe I could have saved the both of us. I could have told him how much I love and cared for him and how I've always understood his pain. I could have told him that we can work this out and find our own way to overcome whatever anger dwells inside the both of us. But he didn't let me talk, and because of that he ended up screwing himself over. Because I could have also told him that Ricardo's real ghost was standing right behind him the entire time, waiting for the perfect moment to kill him. Go get him, amigo.